My name is Raja Guhatakurta, and I'm an astronomer at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I was a physics major in college in India many years ago, and the curriculum there was based entirely on textbooks. I was doing well in my studies. And then, right around the time when dinosaurs were starting to go extinct here on Earth, <laughs> I started research in graduate school in the US. It was really difficult. I had never seen a computer, let alone program one. I'd never read a scientific journal article. Didn't know what research really entailed. Still, I plunged in, unprepared but enthusiastic, and immersed myself in a study of very distant galaxies. Now, the next slide shows a Hubble Space Telescope image of these distant galaxies I'm talking about. Every tiny speck on that image is a galaxy that contains between a few billion to a hundred billion stars. Galaxies are gigantic, but these ones look tiny because they are very, very, very far away. They are so far away that light takes a few billion years to travel from the galaxy to our telescope. I was really starting to get in, into this work. I was getting good at it. Started to write some important papers, went to conferences, gave talks. I was having the time of my life. One day, my friend and collaborator, Shomok Raichaudhuri, suggested we take a digital image of the Andromeda galaxy. The, our nearest large galactic neighbor. This was to be a little side project, a small distraction. But sometimes these small things can change the course of one's life. It was nearly a quarter of a century ago that large format digital cameras were starting to become available to astronomers. So we used one such camera, and we took 57 images in blue and infrared light and carefully stitched them together. That's what you see in this picture, a mosaic of 57 frames. The hard work of stitching this together was primarily done by two of my students, Andreas Berlind, who was a Princeton undergraduate at the time, and later Phil Choi, who was my PhD student at UC Santa Cruz at the time. As far as I know, this was the first digital panoramic image of the Andromeda galaxy. Now, well before we had this panorama ready, I remember being blown away by the sheer beauty of the raw images of Andromeda as they were rolling off the telescope. I had taken pictures of distant galaxies, they looked like tiny blobs, but I'd never taken a picture of a nearby galaxy. It was to be the beginning of my lifelong love affair with the Andromeda galaxy. Now fast forward to 2015, and we have a spectacular new image of the Andromeda galaxy taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. This sweeping arc of stars and dust that you see on the image is our internal view of our own Milky Way galaxy. Andromeda is this relatively faint galaxy in the distance, 2.5 million light years away. And as we zoom in, you get to see the details of a mosaic not of 57 frames, but 2,500 frames, the largest composite image ever taken by Hubble. We are using this image to do our research, and when I say we, I'm proud to be a member of a large team that put this image together. This research, our research, like most research, is inherently collaborative. There are many young people who are making key contributions from postdocs, to PhD students, to graduates, to, uh, to graduate students, undergraduates, even high school students are making contributions. Before I talk about these young scientists, I'd like to say a little bit more about this image. And if you could play the movie one more time, please. I'd like to say a bit more about this image and the broader context behind the, uh, our scientific research. When we get to the end of this movie, you'll see that the level of detail in the image is absolutely staggering. 
The analogy that comes to mind is imagine taking an aerial photo of a beach with high enough resolution to see individual grains of sand. That's exactly what this image is in astronomy terms. Now, this image underscores a very deep connection that you and I have with the universe thanks to a galaxy scale collaboration. This cosmic connection is something my colleague Sandy Faber pointed out to me years ago. Stars come in many flavors. There are luminous blue stars that burn very hot. Their internal nuclear fusion reactions vigorously produce many of the common elements in the periodic table. These stars die by exploding as supernovae. A dramatic death. When they explode, many more elements in the periodic table are produced. And the explosion has the benefit of taking something that was inside the star and dispersing it through its surroundings. So if you look at this image, you can see that when these supernovae explode, they don't explode in isolation. There are clouds, like those dark patches there, clouds of gas and dust, nebulae, that get enriched in these periodic table elements thanks to the explosion of nearby supernovae. Now, these nebulae are very important places. These, these dark clouds are, each dark cloud is actually a nursery where new stars are born out of this enriched material. Our sun, you know, our favorite star, doesn't burn hot enough to produce all the elements in the periodic table. However, it was born in one such nebula out of the ashes of dead stars that were once luminous and hot, but then exploded as supernovae. So in other words, our sun, our Earth, all of the planets are made up of stardust, enriched stardust, because our solar system is embedded within this huge family of stars, and it's a galaxy, and it's because galaxies are very efficient chemical recycling plants. It's because of this that the Earth contains these wonderful elements. Wonderful because these elements form complex molecules like proteins and nucleic acids that form the basis of life on Earth. In fact, I would say that the complexity of these molecules is directly related to the fact that all species on Earth, their form and function, is complex, rich, and diverse. So life on Earth is quite literally the result of a galaxy-wide collaboration among many generations of stars that have produced this tremendous chemical enrichment. Now, the adults in the room are made up of complex molecules, but teenagers are made up of particularly complex molecules, I believe. So, speaking of teenagers, there was another event that changed the course of my life, and that happened right here at this school hosting this TEDx conference, the Harker School in San Jose, California, in the spring of 2009. Thanks to the initiative of the Harker Science Department head, Anita Chetty, three students from the school came to UC Santa Cruz that summer to work with me on some of this research on galaxies that I've been telling you about. This was a little experiment. I found a set of relatively simple tasks out of the things that needed to get done that summer. And Anita sent me her very best students, as promised. We figured if they couldn't get the job done, that would be the end of our experiment. The three students, Andrew, Kevin, and Namrata, many of you know them, didn't just get the work done. They went above and beyond what I had asked of them. I was especially impressed by their ability to adapt to this gray nature of the STEM research environment. What do I mean by having to adapt in this gray environment? High school STEM, where STEM is science, technology, engineering, math, high school STEM teaching and evaluation the world over relies on students solving problems that someone else has set for them. 
I'm talking about homework assignments, exams, advanced placement tests, college admission tests, etc. Students know when they are solving these problems that someone else knows the answer. More importantly, they know that there is an answer and that there's a path to this answer, usually a well-defined path to this answer. Now, it's also the case that this education system inculcates in our students a real fear of failure, a desire to avoid failure at all costs, because it's directly related to a bad evaluation. Now, problem solving in the real world works very differently. It's fraught with failure. The most interesting problems are ones that no one knows the answer to. Once someone figures out the answer or a, a way to solve the problem, it really doesn't make sense for other people to keep working on it. So the cutting-edge problems that define the frontiers of knowledge are usually open-ended in the sense that one, there's no guarantee that an answer even exists. So STEM education for our youth looks something like this. Next slide, please. It looks like a cliff. We prepare our best students to operate wonderfully at one level, you know, and do well in class, do well on exams, on college admission tests, standardized tests, but that level is down here, and we then throw the students into the real world where problem solving is open-ended and operates at an entirely different level that's way up there. And we expect our students to somehow magically make the transition from one level to the other. If you're a student, it can be really demotivating to know that the answer you're working so hard to find is something that no one cares about. Your classmates may care about the answer, but they only care before the problem set is due or before the exam is due, and you better not tell them the answer before that time. Your teacher cares that you got the answer, cares how you got the answer, and hopefully it wasn't by talking to a classmate, they don't care about the answer itself. So, why do we have this kind of gap between high school STEM education and real-world STEM problem solving? Very few, if any, high school teachers, science teachers, I know, have the opportunity or resources to carry out cutting-edge research in the STEM field that they're teaching while they're teaching it. This may be related to this kind of deep disconnect we have. Of course, the full reasons for this deep disconnect are probably quite complex and codependent, and I don't feel like I'm well-equipped to analyze that situation. I do know that one is forced to make a choice. You either go in for STEM teaching or you go in for a STEM research career. It's difficult to do both together. By contrast, anecdotally at least, it seems that it's not entirely uncommon for a high school art teacher to be a practicing artist who exhibits his or her art in a show, or for a high school music teacher to be a concert pianist or a member of a band or orchestra, or for a high school dance teacher to actually take part in dance recitals. So it may well be the case that this gap we are talking about between high school education and the real world, this gap may well be smaller in these non-STEM fields than it is in STEM. Now, in talking to many STEM researchers and educators, it's very clear that people see the importance of learning through failure, of learning through trial and error. Even if you watch someone else go through this process, it can be very educational for a young person. Imagine this. Imagine watching your mentor, the world's expert in a particular area of STEM research, imagine watching them stumble at every turn and bend and learn from their stumbles. That could be very educational. My colleague and friend, Jill Helms, a Stanford biologist, puts it this way, and I quote, it's called research, not search, 
because you don't find it the first time. You have to keep looking. Another example of something that's relevant in this context, but that came from a completely different quarter, is something the para-Olympic skier Bonnie St. John said in her TEDx Youth Talk. She said, and I quote, gold medal winners are sometimes those who get up the fastest. She meant from a fall. Not those who run the fastest, those who get up the fastest. Now, I would mentioned this little experiment we did at Harker. It's been six years since we did that experiment. And there were three students. Recall, there was only one subject, astronomy. There was one mentor, me. This past summer, in the UC Santa Cruz Science Internship Program, we had 104 students from 50 different high schools working with 70-plus mentors, most of them PhD students, who work in 13 different departments at, the, at our university. You know, some examples include a genomics project with, in David Hausler's lab, or research on distant galaxies with my colleague Sandy Faber, a National Medal of Science winner. Could be tracking marine mammals in Dan Costa's lab, or understanding economic price bubbles, modeling computer networks, and so on. These 50 high schools that were represented in this year's program, most of them are from the Bay Area, from Monterey to Marin to Moraga, from Santa Cruz to San Jose to San Francisco, and many cities and towns in between. But five of these 50 schools were not from the Bay Area. One was from Southern California to Two of these schools are out of state. One is in Shanghai, China, and one's in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And this is not the first time our program has had international and out of state high school students participate. So there is very clearly a demand for this sort of research experience as an appeal. And it appears to be the case that it's fairly widespread among high school students, this, this uh, appeal. Meanwhile, more and more STEM researchers are coming forward to be mentors. That's why programs like these are growing. One of the keys to mentors finding this worthwhile is it's important for this high school student's research to be embedded entirely within the mentor's research program. That way the mentor is not distracted into doing something else. They are merely being helped by the high school student's work, just like the high school student is learning. So it's a symbiotic relationship if you set it up that way. Moreover, when you set it up that way, there's bound to be close mentoring of the student by the researcher, and that is a key element of the success and growth of programs like these. Um, in the many conversations that I've had with STEM research programs, what's emerged is there are four kinds of research programs out there. If I could have the next slide, please. There are programs that offer just scaffolding support, where students learn to write computer programs, read journal papers, become better communicators, and other research skills. Then there are programs that offer enrichment, where the student comes into contact with a STEM researcher. The student doesn't do research, but they listen to the researcher share their story about what drives them, what big questions drive them, why they're excited, what techniques they use, what discoveries they've made. They get to see the world through the eyes of the researcher. Then there are programs that are recipe-driven research, where students are given a recipe to go from point A to point B. They're using cutting-edge research methods, but they are bound to get from point A to point B if they follow the recipe. In other words, failure is not built into such programs. And finally, there are programs that are open-ended research. So there are open-ended research uh, projects as well out there that um, offer the full Monty, complete immersion into real research. Now, so things are looking good. They're looking promising. We still have a long way to go. There are many high school students who don't have access to these STEM research opportunities. This includes students in the Bay Area, but honestly, it includes many, many more students all over the world. So this is a call to STEM researchers to step up and be mentors. The world needs you. The world needs you, especially because this kind of, activi uh, this kind of activity works well 
when there is one-on-one -on -one or at, at least one-on-few mentoring of young people by researchers. And this is the best way to engage our young people in STEM research. I want to mention one last seemingly trivial event that really opened my eyes. This was something my daughter's elementary school teacher did in the, her class one day. She would give the children outline drawings of Disney characters to color in. All of you remember doing that. But she would throw in the occasional outline drawing of a masterpiece, like a Picasso portrait, just the outline drawing of that so the children could color that in, or a, a line drawing of a Leonardo da Vinci drawing. And then one day, she went even further than that. She did, took an outline drawing of a portion of Michelangelo's famous painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. She took this, these outline drawings, many copies of them, and instead of putting them on the children's table, on the tabletops, she actually taped them to the underside of the table. So the children had to lie on their back, on the floor, and use their crayons to color in this thing over their head. Just like Michelangelo had to lie on his back on the scaffolding to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. I was blown away when I heard this story. Boy, talk about experiential learning. So, in closing, I'd like to say to the young people in the audience that my hope for you is you will go out into the world and fail. People haven't said this to you before, but I re this is my hope for you. I hope you will fail not once, but again and again and again. I urge you to really follow your passion and take risks. Risk will lead to failure, but be sure to embrace failure, because it's by embracing it that we can truly learn from failure. Thank you.